fantastic. And just as we start, we'd like to thank our sponsors, which you can see there on the slide. Without them, it wouldn't be possible to be hosting the Aussie Live or have uh, the presentations and be able to attend so many of the wonderful workshops that we have on offer throughout these two days. And just before we get started, it'd be great to see where you are all from in our audience. So if you'd like to click a um, marker over on the side here and drag it onto where in the world you are, I can see somebody from Australia has already done that. I'm from Wellington, so I'm going to put mine out where Wellington is. Let's see who else? A couple from Australia, fantastic. Welcome along. Ah, look at that. And I know we've got Tony with us too, and she's in somewhere A. So I'll just give everyone a moment to finish off. Great. Thanks, everyone, for that. So as you know, we're here to talk today about using mobile devices to support teaching and learning. And during this, we're going to look at some tools that can help us think about the way in which we use these devices, and particularly not so much in terms of apps that we use or things like that, but actually looking at what we need for successful implementation for these devices to really support teachers and learners in the classroom. Now, I'm Tara Fagan. You can see that's me there on the screen holding up the iPad. I am based in Wellington, New Zealand. I work for a company called, called Core Education, which is a not-for-profit uh, research and professional learning organisation based um, in New Zealand. Our head office is in Christchurch, but we've got facilitators right throughout New Zealand. I work predominantly with schools around mobile devices and how they can support teachers and learners in the classroom. Um, and I'll pass over to Tanya now, and she can introduce herself. Not sure that we're hearing you, Tanya. Have you clicked the talk button? Just uh, see if you can click the talk button now. All right, I can just see that Tanya's having some trouble um, accessing the microphone, so um, that's fine. I will carry on in the meantime. Just a brief introduction to Tanya. Um, she's from Whangarei, which is right up the top of the North Island. It has beautiful, beautiful weather, and she also works for Core Education and is, um, works both in schools and as a facilitator with teachers looking to around uh, Google Apps for Education and mobile devices um, as well. And when Tanya gets her mic working, we will get her to come in and introduce herself as well. So we'll get started. So you might be thinking, well, why mobile devices? So what we're going to do in the first part of our session today is just out introduce some of the reasons why we believe mobile devices are effective in the classroom looking at what they offer our children, and then we'll look at ways in which, as I said at the beginning, that we strategies that can help support the implementation of devices both in the classroom and school-wide. As we work through this, both Tanya and I will weave through examples of practice that we've seen in the schools that we've been involved with. So one of the reasons that we have found is that iPads and mobile devices give us the opportunity to personalise learning. It means that we can learn at our own level and support the learning in the way that we work best. And that, you know, some of us like watching videos, some of us like text, some of us like being able to listen to material. So we can all learn the same way, but the way that we can adapt and present our information and the way we want to access information for our own learning can be tailored particularly well with the mobile devices. 
Um, and I can just see that Tanya's managed to get back in and talk looks as though it's going to work. So I'm just going to stop at this point and just check that Tanya's microphone's working, and then we'll carry on. Kia ora, everybody, from Whangarei, New Zealand. Sorry, my um, computer just seemed to be a bit glitchy there, but I've signed out and signed back in, so hopefully you can hear me now. Sorry to interrupt, Tara. Fantastic, Tanya, that's working well, and it was a good point to, to try out and just check that it was working. So we're talking about mobile devices giving us the opportunity to be able to personalise our own learning. And that's really important, particularly in these days, and particularly with the ease in which these devices enable us to do that. The other thing that's really important when we're talking about supporting children's learners is the ability for children to be able to use the technologies themselves. Some research that was done in early childhood education in New Zealand that Tanya and I were both involved with we found that when the children were able to use the technologies themselves, their learning and the social connection outcomes were far greater than perhaps if the teacher had done the work for them. So right from a young age, it's about children being able to experience these devices and being able to use them to support their own learning. And it's about teachers being trusting of children and the use of this equipment. As we all know, mobile devices give us the opportunity for ubiquitous learning, that anytime, anywhere approach. So learning is no longer confined to the classroom. It can be done outside of the classroom, in the playground, the schoolyard, or even on the bus on the way home from school. It gives us that opportunity to engage with the learning wherever we are. And it's in a way that we, has never, ever been possible before. The devices these days are particularly intuitive, which means very young age, children are able to use the devices to be able to access some information. It's easy to be able to work out, just to touch the screen, to be able to explore material. Obviously, within that, we need teachers there to support children with their learning, but it's that intuitive nature of, of these devices that enable us to access some learning as well as create. They also give us the opportunity to collaborate and connect with others, and I think this is one of the most powerful opportunities that I've seen in classrooms is one, children gathering around devices to work out um, their learning together as they create stories, create movies, create digital storytelling together as they share and discuss ideas. So along with collaborating is that connecting with others, being able to share their stories around the world with their families very easily, with their classmates. So mobile devices give us the opportunity to be able to collaborate and connect in ways that haven't been quite so possible before, and we can do so very instantly. Henry Jenkins talks about participatory cultures, which is where learning takes place through networking and collaboration. And, you know, as I said in the slide earlier, it's very collaboration is one of the important things that these devices give us, and we know it's important to our learning. And the way that society is changing is that we can write a piece of work, so we might write a story, paste it up on our e-portfolio or our class blog, and it's read by a real wide audience. So whether that audience is the classroom audience or further afield, people are actually able to engage with the material that's written. And I know from my experience is that when I've seen children in the classroom being able to put their work up online, knowing it's going to a wide audience, not just perhaps in their classroom box, they take more care with their work, more pride with their work, and after a while they self assess and reflect and put the work that they're most proud of up for other people to engage and comment on. And when you've got really good collaboration going on, you're finding the feedback and the comments that are coming back in. Um, support that child's work might give them new ways of, uh, new ideas, new pathways of where to go, but uh, re recognising that that work can be shared. Also hugely engaging, motivating and inspiring for all children. I have uh, been part of research that we did down in Christchurch where a number of schools were given iPads on a one to four ratio, so one iPad for every four children. And that happened across 10 schools in the Christchurch area. What the teachers were reporting at the end of that research is that children who were reluctant learners or who were becoming disengaged in the learning process 
suddenly if you gave them a mobile device, they were able, there was just something, it was almost like it was a playful way to learn. They, you know, people were engaged, the children were engaged, and a number of the teachers came back with reports such as, well, we didn't know um, that this child could write so much. You know, with pen and paper, he might have written, you know, a couple of sentences, but with the iPad, we're getting a couple of pages of material out of him. The other thing that they noticed particularly was that the learning didn't stop at lunchtime. So unlike the normal class where they would, you know, stop them and have their lunch, children would take their iPads out into the playground and carry on with their movie making or their artwork that they were creating on. They just found that they were so engaging for all children, or for most children, that they would just continue that learning process even after the bell had gone. Now, I'll give you a moment to read this quote, but just before I do, one of the things I want to, to say is that this quote has come from a report from the University of Hull who investigated are the use of iPads across schools, and they looked at eight different schools in terms of supporting them with iPads. Some of the schools were one-to-one -one with iPads, some allocated machines to students in a third group, um, let the children take the devices home as well as have them at school. And this is a quote from one of the teachers about improvement in motivation. You can see the teachers talking there about the devices becoming important tools for learning in the classroom. And I'll get Tanya just at this stage to put in a link to that University of Hull report so that you've got access to that following this session in case you're not familiar with it because there were some really interesting findings come out of that work. Another reason why mobile devices is the ability they offer us for new ways of being creative. The garage bands, roaring apps, a range of different apps enable us to be able to, to, to create in new ways. And it's not to say that they should replace other aspects of our curriculum because those aspects are still important. But what these mobile devices allow us to do is have access to um, tools at a time where we may not have those tools and we can draw or create on the iPad. But it is also about provisionality in the way that we can take safe risks with our learning. So if we're creating a piece of artwork and we want to add something into it, we can add that in knowing that we can undo it if we don't like it. So unlike a real painting where you've spent a lot of time developing it and you're unsure whether you want to add this or not because you're not sure of the effect, with mobile devices you can add that in and then just quickly press a button and take it away if, if you don't like it. So it allows you to take those safe risks and it's the same with music composition. You know, if you want to add something in, you can add it in and remove it if you don't want to. You don't want it in there or you don't like the way it sounds. So it gives us new ways of being creative. And at this point, I'd like to introduce the SAMAR model um, by Dr. Rubin as a framework that we use for looking at iPad users in classes because you know, often it's very easy just to substitute the technology without really changing the learning that's happened. And there are times where that substitution is really appropriate, where you're wanting to just um, have maths recall and reinforce the learning there. But there are other times you want to take it further because actually if you spend, invest in mobile devices, you're actually wanting to be able to redefine and transform the learning. Otherwise, if they're just used as substitution tools the whole time, then it's been a very expensive investment. So you want to be able to look at the way that you might redefine the learning process. So we like to use this model as a way to get teachers to think about how they're going to augment, modify, and redefine the learning in the classroom. And thanks, Tony, I've seen you've put the link into there so you can get more information about that. Now we've got a couple of videos and we're not going to show them today but I will get Tanya to put them in from schools in the UK that have been using iPads and other mobile devices looking at how they've impacted on the classroom. And I'll just give you a moment to read this quote from Trish Kelleher 
a principal at one of these schools talking about what it's meant for transformation in their school. So you can see there they're talking about changing the way in which teachers are teaching and the way that learners are being able to learn. And there's something about these devices that we know well implemented into a system that teachers are finding new ways to teach. And you can see here this is quite a shift for this principal and thinking about it no longer being that teacher up the front of the classroom, but thinking about that collaborative learning environment. In New Zealand we have a Ministry of Education developed e-learning planning framework, which we use to help support the schools that we work with in terms of um, thinking about where they are uh, around their learning and where they'd like to go and, and what steps they need to take. I know Tony has got the link there for the e-learning planning framework which you'll put in. It's freely available to anyone around the world. And we're going to use this as a guide to take us through when we look at mobile device implementation. We've just revised the e-learning planning framework. Um, it's been out for, I think, about 18 months now, maybe two years that we've been using it, and we've just had a revised edition come out. That's taking into account some of the feedback that we've had from the school and making it a really thorough sound document for schools that are looking at uh, integrating e-learning into their curriculum. So you can see here on the screen, I've just got a diagram that comes from the front of the e-learning planning framework that looks at where schools could be from the pre-emerging stage right through to the empowering stage where they've got the devices implemented in the school. And it's an ongoing continuum where they get uh, teachers and schools and now students and family to think about where they are on the e-learning planning framework. It moved from being very technology focused, which often happens when you're in the pre-emerging and emerging stages, right through to the curriculum learning needs which is the focus when you've got well implemented technology and mobile devices working for you in your school. And within the e-learning planning framework, digital citizenship's been embedded throughout. So it's looking at uh, how to keep children and teachers safe online, um, aspects of digital literacy, and looking at links to the New Zealand curriculum value and key competencies. So it's looking at everything that makes up a digital citizen underpinning the e-learning planning framework. And at this point I'm going to hand over to Tanya who will be taking us through the first section of the e-learning planning framework, looking at leadership and how what considerations you need to think about in terms of implementing mobile devices in the classroom. Sure, everyone. So how we've designed this um, under each dimension of the e-learning planning framework is really just some reflective questions. So some questions for you to think about when you're integrating mobile technology into your classrooms or into your schools, um, the things that you need to think about. So the next few questions are the questions that, um, as a leadership team, you would start to think about. So obviously, you know, starting with the why, what is your vision for um, mobile devices in the school? What's that going to look like? How is that going to fit with your school vision? How are you going to share your vision with the stakeholders, being your parents, your families, your community, and obviously your students? So the first thing is, is to consider the potential of these technologies. So part of knowing the potential is obviously digging deep into the research that's already happened. As we put in, there's um, you know, research that happened in New Zealand, research that happened in Scotland, England, different countries throughout the world. Part of that leadership role is to consider those potentials by reading the research. Um, obviously, also in the context of the community you're in, there will be um, other schools, other classrooms that are integrating mobile devices. So being able to visit those schools, look at the potential, talk to the teachers and find out that information. Part of that also is finding out how these devices are being used in education. So the same process, reading the research, talking to the teachers, and having a deep understanding of the benefits and the uses of these devices. Part of our vision 
is also thinking about how these mobile devices will be used in the school. Will you be um, giving parents the opportunity to bring their own device? Will the school be owning them or leasing the iPads or the mobile devices to the students? So having a real um, what meets the needs of your community. Every community and every school is different, so what it looks like in each school will again be totally different. So part of that, when you're thinking about your vision, is thinking about the needs of your community. And different schools that I work with here in Whangarei um, have gone about this in all sorts of different ways. So whether it be running um, community meetings around um, the e-learning vision and finding out what the needs of the community are. Some schools have sent out surveys to the parents to find out what their e-learning needs are, what e-learning they already have in their home, what their expectations are for e-learning in the school. So really finding out the needs of your community. Finding out the needs of your community can also include finding out what's happening in if you're in a primary school, what's happening in your local, um, in New Zealand, they're called intermediates or high schools. So what's happening in the schools around you? If our parents are going to buy a mobile device in a primary school, are they then going to be able to take that on to high school? What are the expectations of the schools in our community? A really important thing, obviously, is what are the professional development needs of your teaching team? So again, you know, going back to that e-learning planning framework, we don't want to just drop the technology into our classrooms with teachers who, um, you know, have no idea around the pedagogy of using the mobile devices. So working really hard to develop our teaching team's professional learning needs so that they're ready to take on the professional, oh, sorry, ready to take on the mobile devices. Um, I'm very lucky, one of the schools that I work in, their, um, their management team has, has um, employed me two days a week as a um, professional development coach to really support the teachers as they integrate mobile technologies into their classroom. So a really important part of um, integrating e-learning is obviously reviewing if these devices are making a difference to student learning. And teachers in New Zealand are doing that through a teaching as inquiry framework. So they're looking at the priority needs of um, students in their classroom. They're thinking about what e-learning um, e-learning strategies can support the learning of their students and then they're, again they're looking at their progress once the students have used the technology to see if it's making a difference to their learning. And again going back to the research that Tara talked about, you know, there is research to show that these devices are making a difference to student learning but we want to check that that is the case in our schools as well. So um, I'm hoping Tara's going to put in the link here, as part of our enabling um, e-learning community in New Zealand that rolls alongside the e-learning planning framework, there's a whole um, information sector for leaders there where they can um, join discussion groups, they can watch videos, they can um, look at other schools' resources to find out how to support um, integrating mobile de devices in the leadership strand. Okay, so just before I pass on to Tara, I'll um, leave a minute or so um, if there's any questions after that leadership um, dimension. So I'm just going to turn off my microphone and if anyone's got any questions, please feel free to jump in before we move on. I'll just leave another 20 seconds or so. Feel free, as Tanya said, to ask questions as we go through. Fabulous. Um, thanks for that. So we're, as we stop at each section, we will allow time for questions and we'll also have questions um, at the end. So technology and infrastructure is another aspect of the e-learning planning framework that encourages us to really think about where we are placed for implementing mobile devices in our school. So some of the questions that we might think about as we're thinking about technology and infrastructure is can our current infrastructure support mobile devices? 
what do you have already in place at your school and what might you need in order to, if you're bringing in a large number of mobile devices, whether they're BYOD, so bringing your own device, or whether the school's supplying them. So it's thinking about things like, um, do you have enough PowerPoints around the devices that are going to need to be charged? What's your Wi-Fi like? How, how, you know, is it going to be strong enough to cope with the number of mobile devices coming into the schools? And what we've been finding as we work with schools is that allowing enough Wi-Fi uh, for, for, you know, just a one-to-one -one access is no longer enough because often children are bringing two or three devices along with them and having them connected up at the one time. So thinking about how that's going to impact on your school if you have a large number of devices coming in. How are you going to keep the passwords safe? Will you have access for teachers and students? So just thinking about that current infrastructure and how it's set up to be able to support mobile devices in the classroom. Thinking about insurance requirements, which if your school supplying the mobile devices, thinking about the insurance that's required, because that's going to have huge impact on the school budget. Thinking about who's going to be responsible for ensuring the operating systems and any apps that you purchase are up to date and maintained. You know, that can be a really big job. So thinking about who's going to look after that. Will it be one person? Will you look at different opportunities to be able to share it? Will it be something that can be shared with the students? So it may be something that you can actually share with your family. So here's a blog post from a teacher at a school talking about the fact that there's a new software update available for an iPad and talking to the parents about how they can be updating it themselves at home. So it removes the responsibility from the teachers to the families to update the devices. And that's a good way of managing it. Other schools have children in the classroom that are in charge of making sure that at the end of each day all the devices are charged and powered, plugged in, ready to go so that they can be used the next day. So it's thinking about ways in which you can manage that. One of the schools I worked with in Christchurch um, had over 100 iPads come in and they had one teacher setting them up. And that took the teacher, he estimated it would have taken him a good week if he had had all that time available, if he had a full week available to him to be able to set them up. But he had that along with the teaching at the same time. So it's thinking about how you can manage it, particularly if you've got a large number of devices coming in at the one time and the school loans, how are they going to be set up and how are they going to be managed. Um, the experience from the schools I worked with in Christchurch last year was that while they did have IT people that could support them, they needed to work alongside a teacher because the, you know how these devices can be used in education differs from how they can be used in the business world. So if your IT company is not an educational specialist, it's best to have people work hand in hand as you set up these devices. So just some images here thinking about different ways in which you can charge your devices. Thinking about storage, particularly if the devices are still owned and not BYOD. Um, thinking about how you're going to store them, which ways are they going to be kept. There's a number of professional uh, companies that sell storage devices. There's also the bottom two slides show a handmade cupboard where the devices can be kept. So just thinking about how you can do them. One of our schools in Wellington wanted a large number of iPads and didn't want to invest so much in the storage. So you can see here they've just used a dish rack, plugged it in, and, and while it looks messy with the cords, it's actually a very effective way that they found for keeping their devices in charge. And see here another way just of how the devices are stored with a clip and a put in a storage cupboard overnight like this left to charge. Also too thinking about if the devices are school owned, how are they going to be transported around the school? So if they're stored in the office, how are the students going to get them? And one of the schools that I've worked with uses map sacks to carry them so that students don't have to carry a large bin in front of them, but they put so many devices into their backpacks they know that the backpacks have to go over both shoulders and be carried safely to the classroom. And what sort of covers are you going to need to keep your devices safe? There's a range of options out there and it's just thinking about 
what sort of covers you have. And also, too, thinking about if you put a cover on a device, will it fit into your storage system? Because some of the storage systems that are around only take devices without covers. So thinking about if you've got a thicker solid cover, will that fit within your storage system? And if you're looking for more information on supporting this technology and infrastructure in the school, the Enabling E-Learning page, and Tanya's put the link in for us now, has a range of resources, articles, how you might use um, management systems, mobile device management systems, thoughts on Wi-Fi with a range of videos, articles, and different resources that are available for you on that page. And while it is a New Zealand site, it's freely available for anyone to access. And now I'll hand back to Tanya, who will talk us about professional learning with mobile devices. Okay, we talked a little bit about professional learning under the leadership dimension. So I'm just going to go a little bit deeper with some questions to think about um, under this dimension. Um, and I think, again, we talked about this a little bit already, that there's not just by just putting technology in the classroom doesn't mean good learning. So there's always more to learn about using digital technology effectively in your teaching practice. And that opportunity to share your knowledge and ideas with others is very important. So in what ways will the teaching team develop an understanding of mobile learning pedagogy? And this is a very confusing, um, it looks like an awful long quote, um, but I think it's really important, especially when you think about what Tara talked about with the SAMAR model, and this teacher's saying, you know, so at first she was thinking, right, what would I do with the iPad? And I was kind of thinking, what can I do for maths? Or how can I do spelling differently? And then she realises from hearing what other people do on their blogs, that it involves into a really understanding those mobile devices and seeing that it's a much more creative tool, allowing our students to publish and to create movies and to show and demonstrate their understanding through different media. And it becomes a much more versatile tool than using it just as something that they can use for spelling or something they can use for math. So in what ways will there be to um, build teacher and student expertise? So some of the different things that we have um, tried in the schools that I work in in Whangarei is um, using our students. Our students are um, an incredible um, wealth of information when it comes to the mobile devices, and we have used their, um, their teaching skills to on-share with our, um, our teaching team. So um, these four girls standing up the front here have um, shared an app that they're using for their learning with the teachers, and then they're supporting the teachers in learning about that. In what ways will teachers' innovative practices be modelled and shared? So one of the things that we use, again, in the schools that I work in in Whangarei is we have app harvest sessions where um, teachers come along, they talk about the um, learning pedagogy in their classroom, and they talk about the apps that are supporting the learning for their students with mobile devices. We also have what we call uh, speed dating sessions, where again, you know, the um, teachers are talking about what's happening in their classroom, be it around um, maths, be it around reading, be it about writing, and again, talking about how the mobile devices are supporting the learning for their students. In New Zealand, we have EDUCAMPS, and I'm pretty sure that is a worldwide phenomenon, and that gives teachers the opportunity to get together in an unconference-style um, conference that focuses on e-learning and education, and again, that opportunity to network, collaborate with like-minded teachers and share that learning. Um, an event that happens in New Zealand every year, run by Core Education, who Tara and I work for, it's an international conference called ULEARN. Um, ULEARN this year will be held in Rotorua in October and over you know, 300 workshops to select from, from world-renowned keynotes and spotlight speakers. So again, that opportunity for teachers to um, come along to an international event and hear from um, speakers as well as classroom teachers. We've talked about the enabling e-learning site. We also have, as part of this, the virtual learning network, which again is open for teachers from all around the world. Um, very similar to a Facebook page for teachers, um, where all the content is based on educational conversations. 
So the opportunity to join various groups, whether you're interested in um, Google Apps, ePortfolios, mobile devices, um, QR codes, there's an awful lot of different groups within the virtual learning network that you can join where you can find resources and you can have conversations with other teachers. So, oh, I've just described that, the VLN, a social learning community where teachers, leaders, learners and facilitators can connect. So again, going back to enabling e-learning under the professional learning dimension, there's a whole lot of um, information that can support you with your e-learning inquiry, more information about the e-learning training framework, professional development, the register teachers criteria at e-learning. So I'll just um, turn my microphone off for a minute and give anyone a chance to answer a question before Tara carries on with the teaching and learning. Okay, thanks for that, and it's been lovely watching some of the chat in the box um, happening to just some of the ideas, particularly Tanya, you were sharing around professional learning opportunities in App Harvest look as though they're going to be taken on board, which is just great because they, they really have worked um, well in the schools, um, and it's a really good way to get teachers to be able to connect and share their ideas together. So we've looked so far at leadership, we've looked at infrastructure and technologies, we've looked at professional learning. Now it's time to consider how these devices are going to be used in the classroom for teaching and for learning. And as both of us have pointed out throughout this presentation, is that it's thinking about what you do with the devices rather than how many you have or anything like that. And I love this quote from Martin Westall saying, it's not the technology that changes the way you think, it's about you and what you do with it. And it's really important. You can have the latest devices one-to-one -one in your classroom, but unless your teaching and your learning practices have changed, then it's not going to make any difference to the way that you're, you're teaching and learning in your classroom. So it's really thinking about how you're going to use those devices. So one of the things to be thinking about is, how are you going to introduce the devices? So if you're a school leader, how are you going to introduce the devices both to your teachers and to your learners? Now, one of the things we've found with devices, and it's obviously around the world, is that teachers don't necessarily need to know exactly how they work, because the students will be able to show Okay, Tara seems to have um, left the main room, so something must be going down in Wellington, and she's perhaps lost her internet speed. Can you hear me? Can I have a smiley face if you can hear me, please? Okay, okay so I will carry on until Tara um, rejoins us in the room. So thinking about um, how you introduce the devices to your teachers and learners. And the schools that I've worked with, again, have done this in different ways. Sometimes it's been awesome when the teachers have had the opportunity to um, have their own device first and become familiar with that before having to use it with their um, students. Others, um, you know, have, as we talked about before, had those opportunities for professional learning and are quite comfortable when the devices come to their classrooms. Some teachers find, you know, um, I would be one teacher who hadn't really had much to do with devices, but then came in um, to a one-to-one -one classroom and had to really change his um, pedagogy um, very quickly. So it all happens at different times. I've just had a Skype message from Tara saying that she's trying to get back in, so hopefully it won't take too long. Okay, so um, part of that benefit, and again, this is from that um, Scotland research, is that as I've talked about when students have had the opportunity to experiment at home as well, that it becomes more of a partnership. And that's not only a partnership between school and home, it's also a partnership between the parents and the students, because when they're going home with their mobile devices, they are sharing the learning that is happening on a regular basis with their parents. 
Okay, so it looks like Tara is back in, so I'll just flip to the next slide, Tara, and um, you can carry on from here. I'll just turn my microphone off. Thank you, and thanks, Tanya, for doing that. I'm not sure what happened, but I was talking away and then suddenly realised that the whole room had disappeared and my connection had gone offline shortly. Um, and this is one of the benefits of co-presenting with someone, and Tanya, thanks for being able to slot in and, and pick that up straight away. So I, I'm hoping this is the next slide. We're thinking about how we ensure that the learning is blended so that the learning it's about the learning rather than about the device, because it can be too easy for it to become about the device rather than the learning. And that takes some thinking about how you're going to use them in the classroom, talking with your colleagues about good practices and how they use, and also how they've been introduced to both the teachers and to the learners. Um, so that it, it doesn't become a substitution of the worksheet, that it's a blended approach that's used. And so that children have the choice at times of whether they use the, the mobile device, whether they choose to use pen and paper, whether they choose to draw that it becomes just part of the, the environment and they can select which one that they want to use. Now, let's just see if I can move the next slide along. So you can see here, here's a classroom picture. Hopefully you can see that. I don't... Can you see that now? Could somebody just let me know if it's just come through? I'm just not sure that I've got a slightly different format than I had before. Okay, great. Thanks, Danielle. You can see that now. So you can see here the classroom with children using the iPad for some learning. There's computers in the background and it's a classroom with other forms of mobile devices and too, along with pen, paper, crayons, everything. So it's about children being able to have choice in what they use. It's also, and I love this quote, and I can't acknowledge it unfortunately, it's, um, I, I'm not sure where it came from, but I think it's great. It's about teaching children how to think instead of what to think. So giving them the tools they need for learning so they understand how to access information and interpret it for themselves and how to be able to um, yeah, talk to others about what they're learning and share their learning as well. And that can be a change for us as teachers too. So thinking about how too is another aspect of teaching and learning, how you're going to use those devices to make connections across the curriculum so that you might be doing um, an essay perhaps, some writing, for literacy, but thinking about how you can link in some other areas such as your social studies or geography or science. How can you be linking those mobile devices in so that they're just not solely used for writing or for making movies, but they're linking in the learning right throughout. And Tanya will put in a link for this video. This is one, an early childhood one. This is uh, it's a lovely video and I do encourage you to watch it. It's called Little Lamb Lost. It was a video created by a four-year-old who started making out some props at the collage table. And the story is included with the link about how this came about along with the movie. Very short movie, but throughout that it enables connections across the curriculum. So you've got drama being added, you've got the creativity and the art, you've got movie making, you've got literacy as she talks, the retelling of a story, the adding in a voice for expression, and it's a really lovely movie, just retelling a favourite story. So along with that, thinking too about how you'll ensure that iPads are part of the everydayness of the classroom. And I touched on this before. We don't want any mobile devices or iPads to be thought of as, as something special that comes out. That often does happen at the beginning when these devices are introduced into the classroom because they are new and something different, like anything new that we introduce. But we want them to become part of the everydayness so that children are free to select the, what tool they want to support their own learning. And exactly what I said, how will the students be able to choose? Are they freely available? And thinking about things like if the devices are stored over in the school office or administration block, how are they going to be accessed by the classroom? You almost want them in the environment so that they can be accessed every day. And I can see, Sasha, you look as though you might have something to share about what Max does with the iPad. So that would be great if you're able to do that. I'll um, just finish this section because we've got a couple more slides to go and it would be lovely to hear because I've seen Max talked about, um, oh, she got picked there, okay. I've seen Max mentioned throughout in the chat box. So it sounds as though um, he's very involved with his device. 
thinking too about how you're ensuring that the apps that you'll be using with students, how appropriate are they for children in the classroom? You know, thinking about that you can buy, there's some very good free ones, there's some ones that you need to pay for, but thinking of the free, just checking things like the advertising down the bottom that comes with free apps, thinking about how appropriate they are. A lot of it's uh, labelled as educational, but you know, sometimes they're very dubious the educational links that, that might be there for them. So there are things like being able to look at app rubrics that we share with schools that we work with, so getting them to really think about how these devices can be used. And I think Tanya will put a link in for, I think we've got a link for the app rubric. It's come from Tony Vincent's Learning and Hens website. But thinking about how to evaluate what a good app is. And I know Tanya uses similar things with students so that she gets the students to, who might come from home and say, oh, we've got this really good app on our device and can we get it for school? And so the teachers will suggest that the students fill out an app evaluation rubric and get them thinking too about whether apps are appropriate. Uh, okay, Tanya's just going to go off and find the link. And like everything that we've done, I'll put this link in Tanya while you're hunting for the other one. Enabling e-learning has an excellent set of resources for thinking about teaching and learning with devices. And I will just put that link in there. So, you know, like we've talked about throughout, there's really good support that supports this e-learning planning framework. So it's there. And Tanya's now just put in the link for the uh, app evaluation rubric. Thanks, Tanya. Now, is Sasha on? Because I'd love to hear about Max and the um, using the iPad, or maybe whoever suggested that uh, Sasha talk about that. Maybe you could put in, and uh, she's not here. Okay, that's fine. If anyone has any questions at this point or would like to share what they know about children using iPads or mobile devices for teaching and learning, I'll, I'll turn off my mic and give you an opportunity to speak before Tanya carries on with thinking about what happens beyond the classroom with these devices. Okay, our um, sixth dimension is beyond the classroom. So that's thinking about how these mobile devices can make connections with, oh, oops, sorry, mistake, just on the wrong button there. How will our devices be used to share learning, collaborate with parents, I know, and community? So um, this is just a, um, a parent voice from a secondary school parent who has talked about um, how having, in her son's case, um, a mobile device to do his work on has given him more of an interest in carrying out his task. And also, as we talked about just previously, given him um, that opportunity to share his learning at school when he comes home with his family. A lot of schools in New Zealand, as they are around the world, are starting to use um, blogs as a way of sharing learning with, um, with parents. So, you know, some schools have a whole school blog, many schools are going down the track of having class blogs, and at, in, at the moment in New Zealand there's also a lot of um, schools who are investigating using um, blogs as an e-portfolio platform. And I'm just putting together an e-portfolio um, um, presentation at the moment, so actually I'm just going to flick the link in here. So the Manaya Kalani Cluster in Auckland, all of their schools um, have um, e-portfolios for their students, mainly from, so in New Zealand it's year four, from year four, so I guess they're probably year four students are around eight years old. So from about eight years old they're having their own individual um, online e-portfolio space where they are putting, um, putting their, sharing their learning. Um, again, having that opportunity to bring parents in. So these are just some little photos from, you know, parents coming in and students sharing their learning in the school environment with them. This is from um, a school that I work in in Whangarei. So what we're doing is we're also sending home with parents um, examples of the apps that we're using to support the education of the students in the classroom. So that if parents have devices at home or if their um, students, their children have devices, they can be um, using the same device, uh, same apps for them. And all of this, all of the stuff that we're sharing here, so this, um, this Sorry, this handout is on the Virtual Learning Network, which we shared the um, link with before. 
So, um, you know, if you're in the iPad users group on the virtual learning network, all of these resources are in there if people want to share them. Okay, and again, going back to enabling e-learning, again, a lot of resources there about how you can share learning with others through um, different ways and means. Um, so please feel free to delve into these links and check those out. And um, as Tony Vincent, going back to Tony Vincent, who we shared his rubric, I think it's really important that we know um, for the rest of their lives our students will always have a computer with them. We need to teach with that in mind. And knowing now that that computer is not something that sits on a desk, that that computer is the size um, of a phone, the size of an iPod Touch, the size of a Samsung Galaxy, and it can sit in our pocket. And again, you know, you're all here on a Saturday morning, um, so you know that this is an urgent challenge. That, you know, e-learning, ICT changes aspects of children and their learning. And it is an urgent challenge that we simply cannot overlook. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say um, thank you for joining us for this morning's session. And again, as Tara um, reiterated at the start, thank you to Aussie Live for giving us this opportunity to present in um, Blackboard Communicate. So um, I'll pass on to Tara and um, then we'll leave the um, meeting room open if anyone's got any further questions. Oh, and I'll turn my microphone off. Thank you and thanks to everyone for attending. It's a great opportunity to be able to have this discussion. Um, and it would be great if you would like to take the opportunity to share some of the ways that you're using these devices because I think from the methods that we used at the beginning, most of you are in Australia, which is great. And you've probably got some innovative practice that you've got there. And it would be just good to be able to have that discussion. So I'll turn my mic off and hopefully you'll be able to pick up a mic if you want to be able to talk or just put something in the chat box. But we're here for that discussion and also if you've got any questions. Kia ora. Hi, Tanya and Tara. I just wanted to say thank you very much for such a clear and, and detailed explanation on using the mobile devices. Um, I have personally seen a little bit of exciting stuff happening in, in various places, and I think it's still something that's growing. And um, I look forward to hearing about how other teachers are starting to use it. So thank you for coming along early in the morning. Well, not quite as early as us here, but um, I'm presenting an awesome presentation. Great, thank you. And yes, you're right, it's not as easy for us, so it makes it even better that you guys could all attend, given that you're two hours behind us. So um, thank you and thanks for the feedback so far. I can see there's a couple of comments being typed in, so I'll just let them go. Um, but thank you again, everyone, for your attendance and for the opportunity to present.